cherished piece with all my heart. I don't care how many men, women, and children I need to kill to get it. Alright, welcome back to Honored Madman. I hope everyone's doing well. Sorry about the brief hiatus there. I came down with a bit of something, probably just these uh, seasonal allergies. So it should go without saying that there's probably going to be spoilers for just about every single Fallout game and the TV series. So if you uh, don't want to be spoiled, you probably shouldn't watch this. But anyway, we're specifically going to be talking a little bit about the infamous Enclave and what they might be up to in the show. They didn't get the most screen time or anything, but there is a lot to be learned about their brief appearance in the show. They seem to be in control of at least one base on the west coast, somewhere in the mountains, where they appear to be conducting a variety of experiments. And this science facility that we see has several projects ongoing, such as the breeding of dogs to either become cyber dogs or possibly mutant hounds, as well as what I'm assuming to be FEV research, judging by this hulking body that's been covered by a sheet. And the only part of it we get to see is a yellowish-green twitching hand. Seems like they're up to their old FEV shit again. What I found really interesting was that the Brotherhood, despite some of their younger members not really believing the Enclave to really exist, seems to have knowledge of what the Enclave is doing. Or at least the Brotherhood's leadership in the Commonwealth does. But we also know that it's sort of public knowledge that there's an Enclave deserter who's running around. Because a couple episodes in, we learned from the Ghoul that the uh, bounty on Wilsig was placed through, quote, all six agencies. So perhaps this is how the Brotherhood learned, but I like to think that they're monitoring Enclave chatter or something in the area. And it's worth noting that the uh, order did come down from the highest of clerics in the Commonwealth, which I found really hilarious. It looks like the Commonwealth, I guess, is the seat of power for the Brotherhood at this point in the story, and I guess that uh, means they cleaned up pretty nicely at the end of Fallout 4, doesn't it? Or, at the very least, they weren't destroyed by one of the other factions, which really isn't all that surprising. And granted, the game only takes place, I believe, eight years before the show. So it's all speculation as to what happened in the Commonwealth during the events of Fallout 4, just like it's speculation as to what happened in New Vegas during uh, 2281 and 82. All we really know about whatever the canon ending of Fallout 4 was is that the Brotherhood in the Commonwealth wasn't destroyed or driven out. And they've apparently settled the region in the same way they claim to have settled the Capital Wasteland after Fallout 3. It is a bit odd that the newer recruits of the Brotherhood don't really believe the Enclave existed, but this is the West Coast and the Enclave's been gone from here for a long time. Or were they? I mean, they've apparently got this base in walking distance from the Boneyard. Now we'll leave that pot on the burner for now. Because we're not here to talk about the Brotherhood, we're here to talk about the Enclave. But what exactly are they? Who are they? Well, the Enclave emerged from a pre-war cabal from within the American government, one that was specifically made up of influential government officials, politicians, joint chiefs of staff, think like an Illuminatus shadow government type thing. They were the ones who hired vault tech in the first place, and while vault tech may have its own goals and agendas, they are ultimately a pawn of the pre-war Enclave, although the show implies that vault tech might not have taken that one lying down. See, the Enclave wanted to control all of vault techs experiments with the ultimate goal of building a starship and colonizing space. At least initially, the Enclave's goals would change over the course of time. They were a highly nationalistic bunch and even wanted to continue the Yangtze campaign in China after the bombs had dropped as a sign of getting vengeance on, you know, the Chinese communists. Now the show sort of implies that vault Tech may have fucked over the Enclave, as Bud Askins himself says he chose to preserve his junior management staff as opposed to the last vestiges of a dying civilization a la the American government, although it's unclear if he's referring to Enclave members or just regular old government staff. But vault Tech betraying the Enclave certainly would explain this cutscene. It's worth noting though that they're only shown giving this treatment to the vault dwellers who we know vault tech regarded as little more than test subjects if nothing more. 
So the Enclave casually coming in and mowing down some Vault Dwellers and taking the rest doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't involved with vault Tech or its leadership in some way, but the kidnapping of Dwellers for experimentation is certainly curious. But it's pretty much explained when you learn that the Enclave was desperately in need of pure humans since it was a lot easier to make mad science work on them as opposed to irradiated ones. It also helps that they didn't consider the Vault Dwellers as American citizens and it generally fits their M.O. Modus operandi! So that cutscene was from Fallout 2 and that was the first game that the Enclave showed up in and they were like the big bads, the antagonists. And they were generally portrayed as a comically evil parody of all the worst aspects of the American government with extremely high tech weapons and armor. They've mostly contributed negatively to the wasteland, whether it be actively or inadvertently. We see them murdering innocent families and they also happen to be responsible for the second generation of slightly dumber Mariposa super mutants. So after the events of Fallout 1, the Enclave sent a bunch of wasteland slaves up to Mariposa to scavenge everything they could, the FEV, the tech, all that good stuff. But these slaves were exposed to high amounts of FEV, the forced evolution virus, and because of their irradiated nature did not retain most of their wit and intellect, in fact they were sort of just dumbified while also being turned into super mutants. One of the Enclave's own, Frank Horgan, would actually be exposed to FEV, and the Enclave leadership used this as an opportunity to see how far they could take it. How much FEV could they pump into a guy? They essentially turned him into the Bane from Joel Schumacher's Batman and Robin movie. I know not exactly a shining moment for that IP or that director, but a memorable one nonetheless. So Frank Horgan was their prime mutant creation. The second gen Mariposa mutants were just unforeseen consequences of them sending Wasteland slaves to go do their dirty work. That was something that happened specifically off screen in between Fallout 1 and 2. So since Fallout 2 was the first game that the Enclave appeared in, it sort of set the tone for the type of group that they were. This is essentially where the Enclave's genocidal tendencies were introduced, as well as their love of advanced tech and the occasional bit of mad science. Deathclaws, FEV, Cyberdogs, etc. Those three core traits would become the defining hallmarks that characterize the Enclave in all of their future appearances. Almost as much as the intimidating, highly stylish, advanced power armor that they wear. The Enclave's power armor, starting from the advanced power armor Mark I and all the way up to the Hellfire armor set, is usually the most advanced and best looking in every game that it appears in other than the iconic T-51B which would be my other favorite power armor suit, not that anyone asked, which rivals the Enclave armor both in appearance and defense. There's something about that bulky bug-like armor configuration they have that really just looks awesome, in my opinion. They're also known for their prolific use of high-tech plasma weaponry, vertebrates, and robots. The Enclave's big plan in Fallout 2 is to basically exterminate everyone who isn't them, Vault Dwellers included, even though they were technically citizens of America, which the Enclave claimed to be a continuation of. Now this could be because of Vault Tech possibly betraying them, since the Enclave was supposed to be in charge of all of Vault Tech's experiments in the vaults. But as we see in the games and the show, this isn't the case. The Enclave often has to convince Vault Dwellers to open up their doors before promptly exterminating them, or at least some of them, and bringing the rest back to the labs for experimentation since they were pure humans, or at least the descendants of them. Now, the Enclave would eventually be infiltrated and destroyed from within, at least on the west coast, by an individual known only as the Chosen One, the supposed grandkid of the protagonist of the first Fallout game. And at this point, most of the Enclave's high-up leadership fled east, unbeknownst to their lower rank and file soldiers who were forced to fend for themselves. Most of the Enclave remnants on the west coast were either hunted down by the Brotherhood of Steel or the New California Republic, or managed to integrate into the NCR some way, or fled further east. But one thing's for sure, at least to the lower-ranked, non-elitist members of the Enclave, their organization was finished at this point. Their oil rig had been blown up by the Chosen One, and just a few years later, Navarro had been destroyed by the NCR, forcing its dwellers to leave. Much like Dr. Henry from Fallout 2 in New Vegas, some members deserted the Enclave even before the destruction of Navarro, such as William Brandis, who had fled as far east as the Capital Wasteland, which, unbeknownst to him at least when he headed that way, was where the Enclave had set up shop. It's no wonder the guy was so paranoid when some mysterious scientist showed up and started experimenting with the ants. He knew full well what the Enclave was capable of, and if they were in the Capital Wasteland, then it was a cause for concern, and especially suspicion of certain scientific characters like Lesko. 
So even though he had tragically bad luck, Brandis still made the right call to flee east since by the time of New Vegas in 2281, the Enclave is mostly a distant memory with most of its remnants either long gone or executed save for a select few who, along with their descendants, managed to integrate into the NCR and its surrounding areas successfully if not openly. Save for the aforementioned Doc Henry, of course, who does nothing to hide his former affiliation and conveniently takes up residence in a town full of super mutants who view him as a uh, friend. The geriatric enclave remnants of the New Vegas region can be rounded up with the help of the son of their former commander, and they can even play a rather crucial part in the decisive Second Battle of Hoover Dam. It's sort of like in Return of the King when Aragorn goes to the mountain to get those ghosts to help him in the final battle, allowing them to redeem themselves in some way for having been involved with the Enclave in the first place. This quest may be a pain in the ass to trigger, but it goes a long way in showing that not everybody who was involved with the Enclave was bad. In fact, this bunch of ridiculously cool senior citizens aren't evil fascists at all. They were just rank and file Enclave soldiers who got abandoned by their leadership as the organization crumbled. The remnants we meet in the game are a mostly good enough sort. Cannibal Johnson would subvert orders to quote, serve without serving. Daisy Whitman just loved flying and being a pilot. Doc Henry devoted what was left of his life to curing the Nightkin's personality disorder as a way to repent for all the dogs that died back when he was doing mad science with the Enclave. Even Orion Marino, the squad's one true believer of the Enclave, isn't necessarily a bad man. He's just old and bitter that the cause he once fought for is no more and those that defeated his cause are once again encroaching on his land in the form of their sharecropper farms. And their officer Judy Krieger, he must have been at least competent enough to keep Cannibal Johnson and Orion Marino from ripping each other to pieces. Plus he seems like a good dude who wants to just play chess and be retired. So yeah, while most of the average members of the Enclave probably were bad people, not everyone, you know, not all of the Enclave was bad. Most of them were born into it, so it's not like they had any choice. They probably got indoctrinated in the Enclave's cause at a young age. That aspect isn't actually too different from how the Brotherhood conducts itself, but that's a story for another day, anyway. So we saw what became of most of the rank and file Enclave soldiers. They were left behind and abandoned to be hunted by the Brotherhood and the NCR, and the ones who deserted before things got really bad still feared reprisal for their, uh, well, their desertion. But what about the Enclave's organized higher leadership and essential staff that Autumn Sr. fled east with? You know, the ones that were led by a patriotic computer program? Well, that conveniently brings us to the capital wasteland of Fallout 3. So basically, all of the Enclave members that Colonel Autumn's dad deemed essential made a mass exodus to the east coast, specifically while the rest of the Enclave was abandoned in the wake of the destruction of the oil rig, as well as their loss of Navarro to NCR forces. So Autumn Sr.'s group was led by the new president, John Henry Eden, who was secretly a Zax computer AI that gained self-awareness. He had a personality that was said to be an amalgamation of all previous presidents that had preceded him. You know, from George Washington all the way up to Dick Richardson, the president of the Enclave in Fallout 2. Anyway, this new AI president was voiced by none other than Malcolm McDowell, who, unlike Liam Neeson, always brings his A-game, even if it's to a voice role in a video game that he doesn't fully understand. The guy is a credit to England. Anyway, his group of Enclave would experiment with FEV to create a specialized plague that would eradicate those deemed impure to the Enclave, and this led to disagreements with Colonel Autumn, his second-in-command, who was the descendant of Autumn Sr., obviously, and currently the second most powerful person within the Enclave's organization. Colonel Autumn wanted the Enclave to be the saviors of the wasteland, despite the Enclave camps that we see in the game proving otherwise. He, unlike most of the Enclave leadership that preceded him, had no interest in genociding the wasteland completely, as there would be no one to rule over and view them as saviors. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not throwing the good Colonel any bail here. He's still a goddamn cartoon character, evil in a comical way, like how he only kills you if you answer him truthfully, despite him saying that that was the only way you could live. I mean, that's hilarious to me, plus he's got a great voice, and you know we tend to rate that rather high around here. And that being said, he's still nowhere near as bad as the Enclave leadership that his dad served with. I mean, get a load of Dick Richardson here, who is every bit as insufferable as he looks. He's definitely a hundred times worse than Colonel Autumn could ever hope to be, so I guess what I'm saying is that Autumn is obviously bad, but he's an extremely progressive leader when it comes to the Enclave, and all things considered, at least he's human and not an old Macintosh computer that was only allowed to study American history or whatever, like his boss is. 
But regardless of this discontentment in the higher ranks of the Enclave, they were still essentially the big bads of Fallout 3, and were subsequently defeated twice in two very decisive battles with the Brotherhood of Steel. Although before the Enclave was functionally finished off at Adams Air Force Base, they did manage to destroy the robot Liberty Prime as a parting gift to the Brotherhood. But after this and the loss of their leader, John Henry Eden, who had either went down with Raven Rock after being, quote, talked into it by the Lone Wanderer or with the use of failsafe codes found in Colonel Autumn's room, after those two major defeats, the loss of their leader, and the loss of two of their most powerful and secretive facilities, the Enclave was no longer an organized threat on the East Coast, or at least the Capital Wasteland, especially as the Brotherhood tightened its grip on the region in the years that followed this war. Yeah, we still see their camps operating after this in Fallout 3, but their leadership has been destroyed, and it would probably take a while for any surviving, high-ranked members to organize everybody who's left, but nonetheless, remnants of this group would eventually turn up in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts around a decade after the destruction of their mobile base, as part of Bethesda's new next-gen update to Fallout 4, where they made the Enclave Remnants Creation Club canon, I think. Well, it's part of the game now, at the very least. Which I think it fits well enough from what I've played. I particularly liked the Black Devil story about an Enclave member who, after the destruction of Adams Air Force Base, came to the Commonwealth and sort of played Batman for about a decade until he was forced to abandon his suit, mainly due to his declining health. He eventually became this figure of legend to the people of the Commonwealth, or at least the ones whose parents he'd helped. And if this is all canon, the Enclave did eventually track his suit down, but not him. Unless I missed that part somewhere. And the main Enclave remnant that's a part of this add-on is based out of the Atlantic offices in the Glowing Sea, where they are running a recovery effort of sorts to sort of recover some missing Enclave tech. Mainly a couple Tesla cannons, as well as a couple suits of power armor, and some heavy napalmers. Again, I don't know if any of that is canon now, but it felt like it was worth mentioning since it's technically in the game now, after that whole next-gen update thing. Before that, the only mentions of the Enclave were from a few Brotherhood members, Grand Zealot Richter, who was a former member, and this doesn't really count as a mention, but if you're familiar with how the Enclave armor looked in Fallout 2 and New Vegas, the X-01 power armor in Fallout 4 certainly looks a lot like it. Anyway, thanks for listening to this brief history of the Enclave. I'm sure it didn't detract from my initial purpose of making this video too much. Alright, now let's get on to the original purpose of this video. What is the Enclave in the TV series up to? We didn't get to see any of their iconic, menacing, power-armored soldiers. In fact, the only soldiers we did see looked like some sort of British cops. But they did have laser rifles. Extremely crisp-looking ones, to be exact. It's tough to say where exactly this cool little metro-style base of theirs even is, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably in some California mountain range. Maybe even the Grapevine, if that counts. Since Wilzig presumably walked his ass along with CX-404 all the way to the Boneyard of Angels, aka the ruins of Los Angeles, the grapevine would be my guess, but it did look snowy, so there's that. Maybe he came from Klamath or up near Tahoe. I guess he could have even come from much further north like Canada or something, but if that's the case, him and his dog made one hell of a journey footing it across the entire wasteland and most of California. Based on the way it was cut, it seemed like he didn't travel all that far of a distance, but we don't honestly know. He could have traveled quite the distance, judging by the difference in climate to where the lab was that he escaped from and where he winds up. Perhaps his journey was a lot longer than we realize, or maybe his journey was actually a lot shorter than we realize. We were never explicitly told, and maybe it'll get elaborated on in a later season, but honestly, who knows. But anyway, let's get back to the Enclave and the TV show. What are these guys up to? The main thing I'm going to focus on is the purpose of their dog breeding since it was featured so heavily. We see our enclave scientist with a heart of gold, Dr. Siggy Wilzig, falsify the weight of one of these German shepherds in an effort to keep him as his own and to save him from the incinerator. And sure enough, this dog, CX-404, would eventually save Wilzig's life in return. Now, I feel like I have to mention the fact that Michael Emerson's playing Siggy Wilzig and he takes into his care a Belgian Malinois, I think I'm saying that right, I'm probably saying it wrong, but you know the dog I mean, has to be a reference to Person of Interest, which was another show that Jonathan Nolan did starring Michael Emerson, who happened to have a pet dog named Bear who was the exact same breed as the uh, CX-404 or dog mate. Just a nice little Easter egg. It's a pretty good show. I never actually finished it, but I probably should go back and do that sometime. Anyway. What is the Enclave doing with these dogs? Why are they breeding them? Why are they monitoring their weight so uh, specifically? I guess breeders probably do that, you know. 
Also, maybe these are lab-grown dogs. I think it's at least a possibility. But they're basically like weeding out the weak and only letting the strong and the ones who have above average or, you know, the average weight to survive. Which is very pragmatic. It's very much like the Enclave. It's the uh, cold cruelness of their approach that allows them to have such great results with all this cool tech they come out with. Some have speculated that they're using the dogs as test subjects for their FEV, possibly creating mutant hounds in the process. And while I don't generally think this is the case, there is a bit of precedent for it. For example, the West Tech research facility that became the GLOW first researched FEV by testing it out on animals and then disposing the animals and then moving on to testing it on human. We never hear about the results of any of these animal tests, but we can only imagine they were successful enough for them to move on to the humans, at least. And we see that the Enclave in the show is experimenting with FEV, judging by that suspiciously super mutant looking body that's been covered by a sheet whose hand is still twitching. And for the blissfully unaware, FEV stands for Forced Evolutionary Virus. It was originally intended to be a type of super soldier serum developed for use in the American military. It would inevitably go on to give birth to some of the Wasteland's more iconic horrors, most notably the Super Mutants and the Centaurs. It's sort of like a staple in the Fallout series as it's featured in every single game in some capacity. And we've technically already seen one of the results of it in the show. So yeah, it's entirely possible that the Enclave is going to test FEV out on these dogs, and I hope that's not the case, but it's definitely a possibility. No, I tend to think they're making cyber dogs, which are, in my opinion, some of the coolest creations to come out of Fallout. And look, as cool as Eddie is, there's no way I'm going to play New Vegas without having Rex as my companion. That's just all there is to it. Plus, they just seem way more up the Enclave's alley. Cyber dogs have been associated with the Enclave since Fallout 2, it just seems the more likely of the two, and mutant hounds were only made, as far as we know, by the Institute. Sure, it's entirely possible for Enclave scientists to achieve similar results in mutating dogs, but I think it's the less likely assumption. I think the more likely one, of course, is that they're making cyber dogs. That's something that's been a bit more associated with the Enclave, at least in the West Coast titles. Doc Henry, an Enclave scientist, gives you RoboDog, a CyberDog companion in Fallout 2 for helping him out, and then he shows up again in New Vegas to give Rex a brain transplant. Since he was the only one in the Mojave Wasteland who had any experience with CyberDogs in the first place, he was the only possibility to saving Rex's life. And to get technical, CyberDogs were originally developed for American military use by the pre-war U.S. government, which the Enclave does claim to be a continuation of, so I guess they can claim, uh credit for the cyber dog invention and they have been associated with them directly in past games but these dogs weren't just used by the government they were also used as police dogs in pre-war denver it is said though that nowadays the city is overrun by packs of regular feral dogs occasionally led by the remnants of these police cyber dogs fun fact denver is also where caesar's legion gets its best hounds it's probably also where caesar found rex the best 200-year-old dog this side of the Mississippi. Rex is, of course, the canine companion of New Vegas, who, after being damaged in battle and subsequently abandoned by the Legion, he was found by some scavengers and was brought to the King of Freeside, who then took Rex to the followers of the Apocalypse posted in the area, and they managed to get the old dog running again. Again, cyber dogs are extremely tough, extremely durable, and as I already mentioned, very, very long-lived. Basically, every cyber dog you come across is a relic of at least 200 years past, except for maybe the ones the Enclave had uh, improved upon. So, aside from appearing in Fallout 2 and New Vegas, cyber dogs were also featured in the iconic New Vegas DLC, Old World Blues, and while I'm not entirely convinced that Big Mountain wasn't the original inventors of the cyber dog science, we know for a fact that they did improve them to a substantial degree with their experimentations. The Big Empty's think tanks even took the science a step further, as they are known to do, and alongside improving the basic model of CyberDog, they went ahead and made the CyberDog Guns, a series of self-aware miniguns with dog brains that shoot large calibers like 357 and 44 Magnum, and while they're quite clearly a gun, they are still technically considered cyber dogs and are fully sentient like their counterparts thanks to the organic dog brain. The gun's barrel doubles as a robotic sniffer so the dog can use it to sniff out enemy hostiles and even lock onto them for you, which works wonders with the built-in telescopic sight they've got. The gun even growls when it detects nearby enemies. What if he can smell crime? What if he smells crime? <laughs> What if he can smell a crime before it even happens? Holy shit, dude, that's amazing. Smells crime before it even happens. Yes, dude. 
It's even got a pair of metal ears and can make dog noises in combat. 10 out of 10 invention in my book, plus you can feed them Mentats. The Cyberdogs themselves are said to be powered by atomic fusion cores, which means that some of them could theoretically detonate upon death, although this seems likely to be a modification added by the Big Mountain Science Group, the self-destruct feature I mean, and is probably in no way reflected in every cyber dog, as it's been said that no two dogs were exactly the same. The individual cyber dogs' abilities varied greatly from dog to dog. They could be very similar, but not identical. Most cyber dogs possess an onboard auto repair system that will heal them in the same manner as Mr. House's Mark II Securitrons. Some even possess a sonic bark attack, which is visually reminiscent of the trademark brainwave attack that the Robo Brains have access to, which makes sense, but it doesn't appear to be an ability displayed by all cyber dogs. Interestingly enough, they also often have strong personalities, as seen by K9's strict moral code in Fallout 2 or Rex's hatred of hats and those that wear them in New Vegas. Likewise, some models were blatantly far more advanced than others. For example, K9 in Fallout 2 was capable of speech. Or Dr. Boris's dog Gabe from the Old World Blues DLC, he put Psycho in his cyber dog's chow, causing him to grow to a massive size. But those two seem to be outliers. There are some characteristics that they all possess. Creating the cyber dogs is said to be extremely difficult as, on top of all the scientific and cybernetics knowledge one would need, the specimens would have to be created under a high degree of technical sophistication and generalized breeding and training programs, stuff like we see in the show. Probably why the Enclave is incinerating all the uh, dogs that don't make weight. The dogs themselves are somewhere in the middle between cyborg, machine, and synthetic as their organs have been replaced with high-functioning, durable, synthetic organs and a good degree of their outward physiology has been replaced with machine parts. Though it's important to note that they still retain a very canine appearance. They're still very blatantly dogs. The upside is that they're essentially immortal. The only thing that starts to get a little weird is after around 200 years their brains start to neurally degrade and will probably need to be replaced by a fresh one to keep the cyber dog from shutting down. And these guys are extremely durable and hard to take down, to the point where even if you do manage to destroy one, there's still a good chance that it can be fixed up and turned back on. They're very hard to kill, to quote Steven Seagal, and there's something about a functionally immortal cyborg robot dog companion that really just warms my heart. And I just love that even if someone does manage to kill one, it's possible that they can be rebuilt back into working order with all their same characteristics they had before being destroyed as we see with Roxy in one of the Old World Blues endings. I believe she was even reconstructed by Rex. So maybe there still is hope for K9, the uh, cyber dog who was callously disassembled by the NCR technicians in hopes to better understand how Enclave technology works. And when they were done with all their quote unquote research, they'd learned absolutely nothing and had only accomplished killing the poor cyber dog. And K9, he wasn't just any old cyber dog. He could speak. He knew multiple languages. They pretty much destroyed the most state of the art cyber dog in existence. Classic NCR. Now, again, in the show, I'm not completely ruling out the fact that they might be making FEV dogs. I just think that the Enclave, they have a knack for controlling things, and I do believe cyber dogs to be a bit easier to control than FEV super mutant hounds. I mean, look no further than the Enclave's experiments with Death Claws to find your answer. They set out to make intelligent death claws, and they were successful, only they were too successful, and the death claws were too smart and independent and intelligent, and unable to be controlled by the Enclave. They would, of course, have all of the intelligent death claws killed by their man Frank Corrigan, with the exception of Goris, who is said to have survived. But the next time we see the Enclave experimenting with death claws, they have no longer tried to create intelligent ones. No, what they're doing now is they've created these mind control devices that they fit to the Death Claw's heads to control their movements through their brainwaves. And personally, I think that's the perfect example or microcosm of how the Enclave operates as a whole. They are all about that control. And speaking of control, we learn from the character Moldaver in the TV show that vault purchased the means to end the resource war when they purchased her company that was working on Cold Fusion. Now vault being vault put Cold Fusion on a shelf and only planned to use it in their vaults after the world had ended, but I really think they were only able to do that with the Enclave's oversight, or with their help or assistance, or at the very least, allowance. We even see all these shadowy figures watching the board meeting with vault Mr. House, Frederick Sinclair, Leon Von Felden, and Julia Masters, and sure, there's no confirmation that these shadowy individuals represent the pre-war Enclave, 
but we know from pre-existing lore that vault and the Enclave were once working hand in hand. So when vault says that they can guarantee when the bombs are going to drop by being the ones who drop them, I think they mean what they say, but it's only because they've gotten some sort of okay from the Enclave. And as far as I know, vault wasn't the one who fired first. I believe China fired first, but I could be wrong. I'll have to double check that. Anyway, what I think happened was that vault and the Enclave, they had all these plans together, and the Enclave was supposed to take an administration role over the vaults, regardless of what was promised to Sinclair and House and the other investors. But vault also likes control, and I do believe they betrayed the Enclave in some way, perhaps not allowing them to access certain vaults and forcing the Enclave to survive via its own secret government facilities. It's tough to say, but it does seem from Bud Askin's dialogue when he's a brain Roomba that he was supposed to preserve members of the government or the Enclave, but he didn't and instead chose to preserve his junior management staff, which could have been a vault tech plan all along. And now with the Enclave having gotten the shit kicked out of it on both coasts, the vault tech remnants are probably finally able to pursue their own agendas without the Enclave finding them and using them for test subjects for its own agendas. Now, one last thing I wanted to talk about was the character Siggy Wilzig, who I talked about a little bit earlier, Michael Emerson's character. He happens to know a lot about Lucy's vault, and I think that's because the pre-war enclave was privy to all of the designs and schematics of vault Tech's vaults because they were the ones who commissioned them. The social experimentation idea was presumably an enclave idea, or perhaps they were the ones who floated it in the first place, and vault Tech, being the mad science company that it is, jumped at the opportunity. The Enclave, at least in its pre-war incarnation, had knowledge of all of vault Tech's plans and the locations of the vaults, what they were working on, probably even the individual experiments that were being conducted at each vault. So the idea that it was just capitalists that destroyed the world is a bit of a misdirect. Yeah, they funded the destruction of the world, but it was initially planned and given the go-ahead by a secretive shadowy cabal from within the American government. Honestly, it's all starting to remind me of the Escape from New York and Escape from L.A. movies from Kurt Russell and John Carpenter. I probably don't have to tell you guys, but the first one's a classic, and that second one is really underrated. A lot of people give it shit. It's actually pretty good. John Carpenter even says so. Anyway, though, the Enclave, generally what they do or have been shown to do is go around from vault to vault and take back, at least in their eyes, what belongs to them, alongside some pure humans to test the research out on to boot. I imagine that's how Wilzig's Enclave Remnant was able to get its hands on that cold fusion experiment, since Moldaver already told us, the audience, that vault bought her company, which had perfected cold fusion or whatever, and then shelved it as they knew it would end the current ongoing resource wars, which already could be considered an indirect cause of the apocalypse. But yeah, if I had to guess, the Enclave raided whichever vault was supposed to be working on cold fusion and took it for themselves, handed it over to uh, their scientists, and somehow Wilzig managed to get a hold of it so he could perfect it in secret, I'm guessing? Again, it's all very uh, vague. I'll have to watch that scene a couple, uh, a couple more dozen times and get back to you. Maybe Wilzig defected long ago, but has been remaining with the Enclave, perhaps to use his access to their tech to perfect the cold fusion experiment for Moldaver, who might have been the one who got him the tech in the first place. This is all heavy speculation, of course, but if that's the case, I think it's highly possible that vault Tech's leadership, or whatever is remaining of it, could be working with the Enclave. I mean, I'm still not convinced, but it's just food for thought, if nothing else. Personally, I think one of those two groups would rub out the other one for total control of all the vaults and the experiments and, you know, inheriting the world, but that's just me. But I think that's all I wanted to cover today. I just wanted to theorize a little bit on what the Enclave's doing because we haven't seen them in forever, you know? I guess with that new uh, next-gen update, they added Enclave into the canon game of Fallout 4, and they are sort of uh, ham-fistedly shoved in there, but I do like it. I like seeing an Enclave camp brought up into the uh, Fallout 4 graphic style. Although I do think they need to fix that uh, makeshift weapons pack they gave everybody because it looks like Super Mario World up in there. You go into that room with all the new weaponry and gadgets and all you'll see are a bunch of red boxes with exclamation points in them. Anyway though guys, I hope you found the video at least somewhat informative or entertaining. If you liked it, please like it. If you disliked it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me ramble on about various video game or TV topics usually involving Fallout, Elder Scrolls, or Dark Souls or Elden Ring, with the occasional Legend of Zelda thrown in there, please consider subscribing. We just hit the uh, big 25k marker, which is a big deal to me. You know, we're a quarter of the way to 100k. 
That's pretty impressive for a novice alchemist who likes to ramble a lot, isn't it? But anyway, let's have our outro and then some final thoughts and some uh, sneak peeks at what's coming next. So today's video was actually supposed to be the demi-human one, but there was a couple uh, clips I was actually missing of some of the queens, so I had to make a new character. You guys know how all that goes. Nevertheless, it should be up soon. I got the audio done for it. I just need to get the rest of the video. Aside from that, though, the Aldia video, it, uh, it underwent one slight change recently in the script because of uh, some new information, but other than that, it's coming along nicely. I've got a couple more Fallout videos planned in the future, one about super mutants and the, more specifically the smart ones or uh, the ones who are semi-intelligent. And of course, some stuff about the dad played by Liam Neeson in Fallout 3 and a good amount of New Vegas stuff as well. In particular, uh, Dead Money, which is going to be in the same vein as the Aldia video, meaning it's going to take a lot of time, but probably not as much. But it's going to be a big video that I'm going to sort of be a perfectionist over because of how special that DLC is to me. Especially its companions and its antagonist. Some of the best in all of Fallout, really, so it really needs to be done justice anyway, though. But anyway, after the Demi-Human video, but probably before the Aldia one is finished, there's going to be a couple more Elden Ring ones. One talking about the Elder Spirits, which I've talked about. One talking about Ordina, and of course, the Desolation of Millennia. Those three in particular are all in various stages of being finished, and they could really be finished pretty easily once I'm done with uh, the Demi-Humans one and the Aldia one. So that's enough rambling out of me though, I know that's probably boring you guys to tears. As always though, I want to say I hope you guys are all doing well, and I will see you next time. Until then, be safe, and uh, see ya. This is the end, beautiful friend. Chair, empty, dead voices say so.